Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Each episode is a conversation with inspiring people who make wonderful contributions to our knowledge in these areas and spark curiosity and ideas to pursue. Join me, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. There are opportunities to show that you value the other person, even if you're not going to accept their suggestions, even if you think their ideas are terrible, you can still respect them as another person. And maybe they're branching out a little bit. This has never been the part of, of work at the company they've ever done before. They have some new ideas that they learned outside of the business. They want to share them. They may not be very good, but they may be good someday. So maybe you want to nurture the effort, even if you don't want to adopt all of those ideas. And I'm not saying in a crazy, time-consuming way, and you don't have to baby everyone, but there is something between that's stupid and spending lots and lots of nurturing that you feel you don't have time for. Hi there, Innovator. It's great to be back with another episode. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I trust too that you enjoyed my recent conversations with Rich Everett of Everett Coaching and with Michael Simonetti of And Mine. I'm really excited to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Jane Bedell. She's founder of Dovetail Resolutions and host of the Crafting Solutions to Conflict podcast. After working as a mediator and attorney for a number of years, Jane founded Dovetail Resolutions to provide mediation services, helping parties in conflict reach resolutions that are tailored to their interests. Her specific focus now is work as a family business mediator and a family wealth mediator. Jane is fascinated by conflict. She's fascinated by mediating. She does a lot of speaking, writing and teaching on the subject. And as she says, she's always learning about how to keep ourselves out of damaging conflict when we can and how to manage it when it does occur. A quick promotional message from our sponsor, InnovaBiz. We help coaches and consultants build professional credibility, engage their target audience and connect with their ideal clients. To help you get clarity about your ideal client and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship, Take a look at our Marketing Master Mini Class, which you can access at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It is completely free and it's accessible without even giving away your email. In our discussion today, Jane and I talked about the role of conflict in creativity. We talked about brainstorming and how to have constructive conflict. We talked about communication in conflict and owning your communication and reactions. And finally, Jane shared with us about the good, the bad and the ugly type of conflict. Without further ado then, let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Jane Bedell. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today, all the way from New Haven, Connecticut in the USA, Jane Bedell, who's a who's the founder and owner of Dovetail Resolutions, who provide mediation services to help parties in conflict reach resolutions that's tailored to all of their interests. Welcome to the podcast, Jane. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm looking forward to chatting with you. Now, Scott Perry, who was our guest on episode 229 of the Innova Buzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Jane. So big hello to Scott. Absolutely. And I thank you, Scott, because I very much enjoyed talking with Scott, both on his podcast and on my own, and his interest in creativity 
And that's an angle that I think is very interesting when I think about conflict. Mm, yeah. And, and we were having a chat before about uh, creativity, innovation and conflict and how they all relate. So I'm really looking forward to exploring that some more today. You also host the Crafting Solutions to Conflict podcast. So I'm fascinated um, about your podcasting journey as well. And in that, as in all your work, you're focused on always preserving and nurturing valued and ongoing relationships rather than ending relationships and people going their own way to um, avoid further conflict. And your goal is to share a perspective on conflict that's both practical and positive. So I'm really looking forward to digging some more into that. But before we do that, tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. I'd be happy to. It, it is surprising to people, and I understand why, that I say that I am fascinated by conflict. It is true. <laughs> I'm not really sure where it came from, but that's that's me. I do know that way back in 1981, when I was in a joint degree program studying law and a master's degree in public policy analysis at the University of Pennsylvania, I had to sit down with my advisor and come up with a concentration. And we tossed around ideas. And I said, I love that course that I took. I want to take that one next. This one looks cool. We came up with conflict resolution. At the time, it seemed to us a phrase we had heard a few times. Today, I could get a degree in conflict resolution a number of places in the U.S. I think I was ahead of the curve. It has been mm. interesting to watch things develop. There certainly have been people who've done amazing work about mediation and how it makes sense for individuals and, and larger organizations and extended families. I really enjoy reading about those folks and how they think about this. And it helps me do the best work that I do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the whole legal system in the West to me is kind of based on the idea of conflict and it's, it's almost pre-programmed in that you have a prosecution and a defense, you have arguments for and against a particular case or situation, and then there's a decision made that, that doesn't necessarily go through the mediation steps. Mediation seems to be a kind of a different process within that whole system. So how do you see that? Well, it is interesting. The, uh, in the U.S., the, in the civil uh, arena, which is... In, I should back up for a moment. We have different forms in different places in Western countries, but we make the distinction in the U.S. between criminal and civil. And there are other places where they would talk about uh, different types of non-criminal law, but what we have is civil and, and uh, criminal. So in the civil system, everything about the court system is geared towards we're going to reach a point where there's a winner and a loser. And mm. people go through that process for a long, long time whether it is in family court and it's divorcing couples type of work I've never done, whether it's companies who are having a disagreement about a contract, whether it is something else altogether, all these various things work towards a resolution that is not geared to please anyone. It is to make some kind of final decision. And the decision maker is not supposed to be influenced about anything regarding creativity or preserving. They're not allowed to do that. They're not supposed to do that. So a judge or jury is not focused on that at all. What I find ironic, and within the people who are practicing law, it's well known, but not everyone knows this. The vast majority of cases that start out in the legal system in the U.S. don't go all the way to trial. Even the ones that go to trial some of those don't go to verdict. Some that go to verdict don't go to judgment. It is well over 90% that are settled in some fashion along the way. So mediation mm. can be one of those routes. Sometimes that doesn't happen. What's ironic, too, is a lot of pain and agony and a lot of money gets spent often before a mediated result. You could do that way back at the beginning and be done with this situation and move to a more positive place. Even if it's not a relationship worth preserving, it's we can move on. You could move on much more quickly and spending less money. Not yeah. always the way we go. Yeah. So is, is all conflict bad? Not in my view. I have perhaps an unusual way of thinking of it, but as I 
phrase it, there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. And the ugly is the part we enjoy watching on TV and social media and newspapers, if we still have those around. Frequently, it is celebrities or very wealthy people misbehaving in some way. There are arguments, uh, ugly arguments in public. There are families with so much money, you wonder how they can fight. Well, they can. That to me is the ugly type. The bad type is what we talk about all the time. Oh no, I hate conflict. Don't talk to me about it. I don't want to know. It's always horrible. It's painful. If I ignore it, it will go away. Not true. Almost always not true. And then what I think of is the good conflict, which to me is the most interesting in the business context. That's the creative part, which I enjoyed talking with Scott about, the collaborative part, the place where people with different ideas conflicting ideas come together and make a better product or service, a better idea by virtue of having these different ideas. If I'm all by myself coming up with ideas, I'll do the best I can, but I have only one point of view. I'm just me. If I have someone else who works with me or even more frequently works for me and knows what I want to hear and I make it clear that I want to hear you say, great job, Jane. Hmm. You get nothing out of that. But if you have a collaborative and creative approach to conflict, I think it at least doubles, maybe exponentially improves the quality of the ideas. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating to um, split it out into those different areas. And I love the ugly conflict as kind of more entertainment, isn't it? There's And the reality TV shows actually exactly. construct construct that uh, environment that um, brings that out. <laughs> the worst um, in all of us, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the idea of um, positive or constructive conflict in the situation you described where people get together to explore ideas and perhaps um, different perspectives are put forward, do you think people see that as conflict? Maybe not. I do, but they may see hmm. that as, oh no, that's brainstorming. That's, to me, what's really happening there is there has been permission granted. Sometimes it's always there in the culture of a company or an extended family or a neighborhood or whatever it may be, where it's okay to disagree because we have enough trust. We can pull it together that we can disagree about things. We can still move forward together without something catastrophic happening because we disagree. But I think frequently, you're right, people don't see it as conflict. I think that's a way to have a better understanding of conflict and a better comfort with it. So many people are just so upset about it, so frightened by it, that they will stick their heads in the sand and that will do more harm than good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you mentioned brainstorming. Of course, one of the um, rules that's often applied to brainstorming is that you start off, everybody puts forward as many ideas as they can think of for the particular subject, and nobody's allowed to critique any idea at that particular point. And later on, there's there's then a conversation around, well, is that idea any good? Or, you know, how would that actually work? Or whatever the questions might be, which is where the conflict then might come in. But um, so in a way, the process is again geared to push conflict out of the equation. Or to delay it as long as possible. Yeah, and yeah. I think I think what's very important, and again, this is sort of a cultural idea of this is the way we do things here. You can have that moment where you're going to, okay, we're going to put these things through their paces now. That's a swell idea, but that's a little too far out there. Is there a way to do that that says, I celebrate the creativity? I'm glad that you made the suggestion because we might we might move toward that in some other way. Or is it a shutdown? Is it, can't believe you said that. Well, that was very yeah, clever yeah. if you were to brainstorm, but come on, be real. There's so much that we say with our voices, obviously with our tone and with our body language and with our actual words that can be so wounding. And if, if our goal is to make sure that our way is adopted, well, okay, you can still do that in a way that doesn't say, please don't make any more suggestions. We're, we're done with hearing from you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, of course, you've um, 
You've raised a really interesting point there that uh, it occurred to me uh, in in brainstorming. It's always good if you look at an idea and say, "Well, that's never going to work. That's too far out there," or you know, "That's that's going to rub somebody up the wrong way, so that people are going to um, put barriers in the way of that." But you can also look at something and say, "Well, you know, there's a whole lot of issues with that idea." But what's the concept behind that? What can we learn from the idea? And is there anything there that we can learn that could be applied to another idea that has legs and that would make that even better? I think so. And I think that's part of it, the idea of what can we take from this good idea to pair with another good idea? Do we? And maybe we don't have to start over on some things. Maybe we've just learned something about our current process and said, we don't need to throw it out. We need to just change it a little bit. But I think a lot of it is it's a um, it's a mindset of do we reward people for thinking this way about conflict, mm. or do we reward people within our company for being the ones who are the right ones? I got it. I'm right. I get a special prize because I did it all by myself. Or is it? No, we're all here. We're trying to figure some things out. How do we move forward? And I think sometimes people find a frustration if there's too much emphasis on teamwork and I don't get credit for what I really did, but probably there is a balance as with so many things between it's all one or it's all the other. And there's a place there to build on this piece and that piece and together they're better than either one alone. Hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's a really good approach to that. And perhaps it involves some a different mindset around conflict. I think you're right. I think it very definitely does that. And certainly within some companies, the idea of just shutting it down or this one has superiority over that one, whatever the first one, the one with superiority is just going to call the shots period. And Mm. don't, don't bother me. Um, And that's the only way we can make decisions. There are ways to keep it in line though. You don't want it to be, well, I think that's a bad idea, so I'll just ignore that. I'm going to do my own thing over here until I get caught. I don't think that's it. It may be something as simple as there are certain times when the door is open to somebody at the top. And it's not all day every day, but there are opportunities for even the lowliest of of workers who are actually doing a lot of good work to come forward with an idea and to be able to be heard in a respectful way. I think there is no substitute. We all want to be heard. We want people to listen to us with respect. Whether they agree with us is a different thing, but so much easier for me to get on board with an idea I don't like if I at least had a chance to say, isn't there a danger that X or Y will happen if we go that way? And if someone can hear me and say, I appreciate what you've brought forward. Not shoot me down. Maybe say, thank you, Jane. We're not going to go that way, but I do appreciate that you had an idea and you shared it with us. Hmm. Yeah, and also if if it's a question of, you know, isn't there a risk there um, that, yes, we've considered that risk or, or oh, no, we haven't considered that risk. Thank you for pointing it out. Yeah. And yeah. let, let's work out what we can do about it. Yeah, I think so. And I think the to me, the idea of innovation is all about, maybe it's a corollary to um, necessity as the mother of invention. It's, we need to change something because what worked before or what everyone else is doing is not solving this problem, this challenge, this puzzle. And that to me is a lot of what conflict is. It's a puzzle. It's a puzzle mm. to be solved. How do we go from where we are now to a better place? That's how I think of innovation frequently. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting you mentioned change and um, I was reading something the other day and I don't recall now who said this. It it was um, either an email or in a book or something. I thought that's actually brilliant. You know, people 
a lot of people are resistant to change and they say, you know, we, we don't like change. We can't, we can't change. We're not built to change. And yet the human body changes all the time. I mean, leaving aside aging and all that stuff, you know, if you walk up the stairs, your heart rate will increase in order to supply more oxygen to the muscles doing the work. So that's change. <laughs> so Absolutely. the body is a change machine, which was what the point this was making. And so, you know, if, if we understand that, we can say, well, we're actually all really good at change. And I think that goes to the idea of risk. And as people become very comfortable in one place, in one way of solving a problem or doing a job, boy, I don't know if I want to risk trying something else. Maybe I won't be very good at it. Mm. Maybe I won't instantly be good at it. I don't know if there's much of anything that's worthwhile that we are instantly good at. It will take a little time. But that fear, sometimes of criticism, fear that of competition, that someone else will look better than I do. I'm afraid to take that chance. I think that can be very inhibiting to folks that Oh no, change change could only get worse for me. I won't end up in a better place. I'll end up in a worse place. Hmm. Yeah, you mentioned earlier about sort of the win lose mentality in the legal system, and I guess that um, you know that plays out in a lot of different scenarios as well. Do you think there's um, there's conflict could be kind of seen in a different light if people take more of an abundance mentality? I do. I do. When people have that idea of we have a pie and we're going to slice it up and that's all there is to it, that's a very limiting way of thinking. It's also a common way of thinking. But if we can think about expanding the pie, is there some way that we can make this a better situation? For instance, let's say it's a salary negotiation if it's only a negotiation very specifically about how much I will be paid starting the moment I begin the job, well, that's fairly limiting because I get more, you get less. What about other ways to look at that? It may be that what really matters to me in a new job is opportunities for, for professional advancement. You can give me the salary that doesn't thrill me if if you will also agree that you will pay for some education for me. So I get better at doing something that will be good for you, the company, and good for me personally. And maybe there's some reason for the company to say, great, that's easy. It's a different budget mm. uh, division, or we have an understanding with a, with a nearby university where we can make that happen below cost for us. These sort of ways to look at things a little differently. I'd like to share with you a story that mediators tell about an orange. And it is all about the idea of thinking in a very limited, cut it in half, cut the baby kind of thinking, which sometimes arbitration is, which is quite different from mediation. One orange and two people. These two people feel I must have one entire orange, but there is only one. Half an orange is of no use to me. Three quarters of an orange is no use to me. So what do these two people do? Well, bang their heads against the wall until they speak with someone who is a mediator. And the mediator says, tell me more. And this, this is an idea that mediation embraces of positions and interests. My position is I must have one whole orange. But the question more accurately and more positively, well, why? Why do you want one whole orange? That's my interest. My position is I must have a whole orange. My interest is quite different. In this case, the first person says, I need one entire orange because I have a recipe. And in that recipe, I need the juice of one whole orange. Mm. Okay. And the other person also has taken the position, I need one whole orange probing a little more, that person's interest is in the zest of the orange. That person is working with a completely different recipe. And once you get past the positions of I must have, and the other person saying I must have, you can find a way to satisfy both needs. Hmm. Not always as perfect as that, 
but it's a great illustration, I find, because it's easy to get it. It's like, wait a minute, I have to get past the demand. I must have this. The counter demand, well, you can't have that. You can only have this much. Is there some other way? But I think it very much is partly the idea of abundance. If you see everything as a set amount that we need to split up, that's pretty narrow. If you think about what can we do to make this work better for both of us? That's that's a different mindset. Hmm. Yeah, I love that story. And and I love the idea of using the whys and digging into the the reason for um so understanding the reason for the position that the person is taking as opposed to just understanding the position. Exactly. Hmm. So what yeah. What's the role of creativity in in mediation? In like the, that's a really good story, but I'm sure that, that there's lots of um, conflict that is much more complex than that, and uh, you need to be quite creative to come up with a solution that that both parties are happy with. Well, or happy enough, mm. <laughs> because sometimes full happiness is not on the table. They wouldn't be involved with a mediator if both could have everything they wanted frequently. Mm. But you can dig a little bit to say, is there a place where you can both be happy enough? Is there something that allows you to get enough of what you feel you need to have? Sometimes it'll be as wonderful as the orange. Sometimes it's a question of timing. I need to have this right now. In an ongoing relationship, for instance, between um, someone who, two sides of a contract, and there could be a frustration of, why do you never pay me on time? And the one who never pays on time is well aware. I never pay you on time. I don't feel good about it. But if they can have a conversation, well, maybe the reason they're never paid on time is it's just the wrong day of the week. It's the wrong week in the month. We need to make a change so that I can and will pay you on time. But it has something to do with the cash flow. I could pay you the third Thursday on time always. They will never pay you on time on the second Thursday or the second Wednesday or the third Wednesday. But they need to get past that inability to talk about it. Sometimes that's the most important part of a mediator, just being an outside and neutral person who can help these folks get past the putting up the bricks of, don't talk to me, just pay me. We're not going to work it out. I'm so angry. I feel I'm being ripped off. That may happen. Most of the time, there's more to it. And there is a way that they would like to continue to work together. If they both aren't getting along, they should just figure out a way mm. out. But frequently, that's not that's not easy to do. There may not be others who have that in the supply chain. There may not be others who can satisfy the contract any better. There needs to be some change. So the mediator's value in part is just being different, just being outside of it. Just don't have a horse in that race. I'm not on anyone's side. And that's always essential. Some of the work I do is with family businesses. And there, the emotional piece is very important. And if only one person contacts me, which is typical, we need to be very careful. And I'm very explicit early mm -hmm. on in explaining, tell me a little bit about the situation, but very little. I want you to understand generally what the process is, what I can and cannot do. I want you to look at the videos on my website, look at my LinkedIn page. I suggest you listen to a little bit of the podcast because you will hear me and you will get a sense of whether I am the kind of person you would like to have involved. And then I want to have that same brief conversation with everyone who may be involved. And then once we have a commitment to go forward, then I will talk with everyone in great detail. But if there is a perception that, oh, well, heck, Mary's the one who found Jane. Mary has polluted Jane's thinking by telling her her side of the story in great mm. detail. I lose part of my value before I even begin. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you you raised kind of two things there around communication and the, the emotions that um, get involved. I mean, clearly a very personal conflict like a family situation or um, perhaps a relationship breakdown, uh, emotions really play a, a very high 
role there, but I guess ego comes into it a lot in in business situations as well and particularly when people are are sharing ideas and perhaps feel their idea isn't being heard or valued um the how important is is it to kind of get to a point where or sorry that's the wrong question this is critically important but how do you suggest we get to a point of communicating in a way that we can acknowledge those feelings but not have them get in our own way or get in the way of, of a good outcome. And those are both important. There is the getting in our own way and getting in the way of the outcome. They're both mm. separate but very important questions, I think. Part of it is setting the tone before things get ugly. To keep people in the loop, let people understand what's going on, have a positive relationship with each other before there's a problem. Sometimes it's a, there can be families in business that struggle because it's that role of when am I, which hat do I have on? Am I mom right now? Or am I the person who is speaking to someone else about getting the job done? It can also happen, particularly in startups and in situations where there is a lot of energy and enthusiasm and these people believe in this new product or service. They're gung-ho. We're not going to spend any time or energy on what could go wrong. We're not going to put any procedures in place for buyouts or anything like that because everything's come up roses. This will be great. We've got the best idea and we have to hurry because someone else will get it. Hmm. Still worthwhile to try to keep each other apprised of where your head is and where you think you're going. This idea of getting in your own way with your emotions, I think is very important to deal with. You will hear hear people, you will hear people say, don't get emotional. I find that (laughs) wildly unrealistic. (laughs) If we are robots, we're all set. Usually that's a really, uh, that's a red flag at a bull, isn't it? It kind of triggers (laughs) the emotions that that were perhaps being controlled in some way before that. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. If someone says that once... So the the recipient of that message is usually already showing some emotion. (laughs) It's like the ultimate put down, like, don't be emotional. Like, oh, wow. Maybe they're heading to fisticuffs after that one. Just don't, don't say those words. But I think it is true that if we know that we are particularly triggered by certain statements made to us, we can think about how do I not let that get under my skin too much? How do I not go crazy? Especially when it's people you know, when it is someone you work with on a regular basis and you know that that person has a tendency to say, for instance, you always, well, always and never are just dangerous words Mm -hmm. most of the time because they're rarely true. You always do this wrong. Like "Mm -hmm, maybe sometimes, but not always. But you can see that coming sometimes. You know that something difficult is coming you can prepare yourself a little bit to say, "Mm, Jane, you know what she's going to say. This is how she always deals with this when this thing starts to go off the rails. The fact that she's going to say something that could make you crazy does not require you to go crazy. You can hear it and let it roll off your back a little bit. Think about why does that bother me so much? And then deal with it ahead of time. Also, when you're going to say something to someone else that you know they are not going to like, you can think about what you know about that person. Some of us, for example, want to hear every detail. Tell me the plan. I want to know everything that can go right, everything can go wrong. Others of us, please don't do that. Give me the broad strokes. That's all I need to know right now. And when you work with someone on a regular basis, you can kind of have a sense of, What does that person need? If I want this to be successful, I want to deal with what that other person needs to hear or not hear. If I am worried about myself, I can do whatever I want. It doesn't lead to success necessarily. And I will say some of these ideas are based on a fabulous model of coaching that I started to learn a year ago. It is the Synergy, C-I-N-E-R-G-Y, Conflict Management Coaching Model. And it is built on ideas of coaching, 
ideas of conflict resolution, and ideas of neuroscience. I took this coaching workshop to get started. I thought it would be good. It was much better than good. I Mm. thought it was phenomenal. Basically because it can help an individual in a difficult situation work on what they can control. One of the challenges sometimes in business mediation is getting the necessary parties to the table. Sometimes they are never going to go to litigation. No one's going to sue anyone. We're just going to damage each other Mm -hmm. and the company, which is not particularly good either. But if it's a situation where one person says, I could get better at dealing with this, and that's going to help me in this very specific situation, it can also help me more generally knowing what my hot buttons are and not overreacting maybe not reacting at all, but responding when things happen, staying away from, as some call it, the lizard brain reaction of off we go. It can be very helpful sometimes when there are two people who are, they just are oil and water, working with them to figure out, okay, how can you have a conversation that gets to the substance instead of we get stuck immediately with how dare you speak to me that way? Hmm. Yeah, that sounds fascinating, the synergy conflict management thing um, uh, approach. Uh, there's, <clears throat> there are quite a number of things in what you've just told us there that I think is is really valuable. And it's around the idea of communication and owning the communication. So owning the communication on the one hand in the sense of if somebody says something to me that causes me to causes an emotion, let's say it makes me angry or makes me upset. Um, that's my response to it. Now I can choose that response. And the once, I think once you understand that you actually have a choice over that response, that just because somebody else has done or said something isn't like, it's not, a a written rule or (laughs) chiseled in stone that you have to respond in this manner. You can actually choose your response. And that's kind of freeing in a lot of ways. And I think that kind of takes the conflict into a totally different direction. And the other side of that, of course, then is owning your communication. If you see what you do or say is causing a response in the other person that is unwanted, um, then again, you actually have the power to change your communication. Uh, that, And in saying that, a lot of people feel that that's false. Um, so what, what's your response to that? Because, I mean, I, clearly I don't believe that. Um, I think you can still be true to yourself and modify your communication in oh, order yeah. to get a different Absolutely. response. I would never suggest, well, for instance, I can't think of anything worse than a false apology. Mm. That makes matters worse almost yeah, yeah. always. People see through that immediately. Okay, great. So now you've insulted me. I was already upset. And now you've insulted me with a false apology. Just don't do that. Doesn't mean that you must be rude to get your point across. Doesn't mean that you need to be harsh. Doesn't mean you need to get that other person upset to get your point across. One thing that I find has happened in recent, certainly in recent decades, but I can remember giving away my age here when we typed on typewriters. <laughs> it took a long time to get some message across in writing on paper. And you didn't want to make mistakes because it's a real hassle to deal with the mistakes. <laughs> so people were very careful. You thought it through. Then, of course, it became very different when, oh, you know, boom, there it goes through the computer. And then emails and texting and social media and very brief and fast responses to what someone has said. Sometimes before they've even finished, you can get into a texting fight with someone before they've even finished (laughs) saying something. It's like, yeah, rarely a good idea. What I think is so interesting is that you do have some control over yourself. For example, If you are going to send an email and certainly given a choice, I know some folks are old news. I'm done with emails. It has to be a text. Even with a text, you can choose to wait just a little bit. Ideally, if it's truly important, 
I would say put it aside for hours at least. I also find it's interesting, and I learned this years ago, and I wish I could remember who taught me this. Send yourself an email <laughs> that is the difficult message that you must send to someone. Send that draft to yourself. There is something about seeing it on the screen addressed to you hmm. coming into your inbox. And you see that like, okay, I didn't really mean to say it quite that strongly. Or I I started out immediately with the, let me attack you. Hmm. There are ways, whether it's spoken or written, to acknowledge another wonderful thing, just to acknowledge someone else. We love hearing that. Thank you for the suggestion. I heard what you said. It's interesting that you suggested this. I appreciate your interest. Any of these sorts of things that can at least be the first step that says, I'm not rejecting you personally, and I'm not angry or disappointed. I'm not laughing at you that you made this suggestion. I am going to reject it, hmm. but I can do that in a way that doesn't infuriate you. I think that that can be very helpful. Frequently, and this is so atypical of the way we live today, there is beauty and power in taking a pause. Just stop for a moment. Mm. And sometimes it truly is a moment before I react, not a response, but a reaction. Just stop before you let those words fly out of your mouth or through your thumbs. Just stop for a moment. Allow yourself to breathe. Think about why the emotions come in here. Why am I so upset? I could not agree with my coworker's suggestion, but that doesn't have to get me really upset. Just take a moment. Mm. Yeah, that's that's really great advice. And <laughs> I love the, the text message argument because I, I often, um, when I'm sending a text, I often hit the, uh, I can't remember how I've got it set up, whether it's the enter key or control enter or whatever that sends. And, and I often hit, the wrong key so that half the message gets sent and then I follow up with the rest of the message. So if, if somebody takes offense at, at the first half of my <laughs> message, and I was I was going to kind of clarify the rest of it actually clarifies it and that gets into an <laughs> argument. I can imagine that can be really funny in a not nice way. Yeah. And I, for me, because we have so many ways to communicate, I can half the time remember, oh, wait a minute, that's how I do it on LinkedIn and that's I do it on this particular platform. I'm not always sure. And because we're racing around, we go back mm. and the other. And sometimes, somehow we now put great value on speed. Well, quality counts too. It's yeah. nice to do it right the first time instead of making a mess and then digging ourselves out of it. But by the same token, people like to hear a response. And I think that there are opportunities to show that you value the other person even if you're not going to accept their suggestions, mm. even if you think their ideas are terrible, you can still respect them as another person. And maybe they're branching out a little bit. This yeah. has never been the part of, of work at the company they've ever done before. They have some new ideas that they learned outside of the business. And they want to share them. Mm. They may not be very good, but they may be good someday. Yeah. So maybe you want to nurture the effort, even if you don't want to adopt all of those ideas. And I'm not saying in a crazy, time-consuming way, and you don't have to baby everyone, but there is something between that's stupid and spending lots and lots of nurturing that you feel you don't have time for. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. And on the point of quick response, I mean, you can go back with an email, for example, and say, interesting idea. Give me a day or so to think about that. And then I'll get back to you with a considered response. And so that, Perfect. that's a quick response that probably doesn't trigger any emotions. And then if you're feeling some emotions around that, you can do the trick of sending yourself the email. And I'd, I'd actually send myself the email and do the delay on it, send it so that it arrives the next morning so that then you've had the time to, time to um, reflect as well, and then you see what you've written, and you think, "Oh my God, <laughs> I can't, Oops, I can't didn't mean that." that. 
And I, I love the idea of sending a quick email that says, thank you, and I will give you a considered response. I can't imagine anyone feeling anything but good about that. Mm. I was heard. I got a, a speedy response. And you're going to give my idea some thought. Wow, this is great. This mm. is like the trifecta. This is all good stuff. I think that that's a wonderful idea because it's just the kind of response that we like to hear that, oh, okay, this this is good all around. Doesn't mean that we have a guarantee that my idea will be adopted. And that's okay. Mm. That's, that's okay. Hmm. All right. Well, this is wonderful, Jane. I could keep going for ages on on the topic of communication and the causes of conflict. We haven't even got into that yet, or or your um, your terms that you use about elephants in the room. I think we all understand that in the English language. But the ones yeah. that fascinate me are expanding pies and cookie cutters. But I think oh. I'm, I'm looking at the time, so we might have to put those off to another episode. I think. Um, I think it's a good time to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. And yes. It's designed to help our audience who are primarily innovators and leaders in their field with some tips from your experience. So I, I guess we've, we've, we've got a few things that you've already shared with us on creativity and innovation but um, and how that ties in with conflict. So maybe we'll get some more that will inspire people to go and do something awesome today. That sounds fun. Okay, so what's the number one thing you think anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Think widely, broadly, deeply. Hmm. That's great, yeah. And people call that out of the box, but I think um, if you structure it, I like the structuring widely, broadly, deeply because it kind of you know, brings up questions around, okay, here's an idea. Um, the widely would be, well, what else? What else could you do with that? Or what else could that do? Um, the uh, deeply would be why, and you talked about why a little bit today. And then the broadly is, well, what does that do for you? So it's kind of going up to bigger picture. I think so. Mm. I think so. And, and we don't always allow ourselves to do that. We think very specifically sometimes about how do I fix this one glitch? I think we can do better than that frequently. Mm. Yeah, great advice. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? I think mostly it is a combination of listening to myself and listening to other people. The listening to myself part is if there's that nagging thing that says, hmm, I could do better at this. I could take a different approach to this. It would be easy to shut that down, but if it, if it nags at me enough, that means something. Mm. And then I've had the good fortune to know people in very different types of business, very different perspectives, and they all have something worth listening to. And if I allow myself to just focus in and take what works for me, because not everything will work for me, then I can really build on those good ideas. Mm. Yeah, that's great advice. And I I think, well, there's a, a big self-awareness element there, but the other one that I really like is listening outside your own area of um, of specialty and looking at things and combined with what you said in um, in being more innovative, thinking more broadly and widely and deeply around those things that can be applied to your particular um, skill set. I think so. I do. I, I agree. All right. Do you have a favorite resource that you use most often? Favorite resource? That's hard to say. I think that I have enjoyed, especially in recent years, the, what would I even call it? I think the the good thinking and the research and the willingness to share experiences of various folks who are in my field or close. And there seems to be more and more of this over time of people who are willing to go on to webinars and usually within a professional organization, but share what they have learned and what the rest of us might think about. I have found that to be so useful because they are coming just similar to the idea of listening to other people, but very specific ideas sometimes. So I have found, of all things, membership in a few key professional organizations to be very helpful to me. Hmm. Yeah, and it's wonderful these days, isn't it, with 
the internet that we can kind of listen to people from all around the world and it's very easy for everyone to jump on a webinar as a participant or even to run a webinar and share your expertise. It's fantastic. And I started to learn how to podcast a year ago and still I'm in contact with some folks who were learning at the same time in the podcast fellowship. And uh, we get together when we can once a week. And the person who usually is moderating is based in Wales. I'm on the East coast of the U S we have someone on the West coast of the U S we have someone in Germany, a couple folks in England who pop in and one person in Western Canada. Mm. The only thing we have to keep track of is this time of year, <laughs> whose time change has happened and whose hasn't. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> that's always a challenge <laughs> in October and in March, April. Yes. Okay. Um, so what's the best way to keep a client on track, particularly if, if you're working with them in conflict situations? I think staying right on top of changes. And I'm. this is a new thought for me. And it's because I have seen someone doing this in a way that when I first witnessed it, I thought, this is a step away from obsessive. And then I realized <laughs> nothing is slipping through the cracks. This is someone who works with a lot of people at different stages in approaching a particular issue. It's not my field necessarily, but nothing will slip through the cracks because every time there is the smallest of changes, it is recorded. It is in writing and it goes to everybody who needs to know. So there's no, oh yes, we'll get to that next time. We'll update the plan next week when we have three things that have changed. Nope. Nothing gets lost. And I thought that's powerful. Hmm. It sometimes feels a little annoying because only one thing changed. But again, that's the beauty of doing things digitally it's okay, I just change, well, there's one more little update, and that's fine. That, that works because we're all in a literal, not quite sense, but a figurative sense, we're all on the same page. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to do it. I love uh, the various tools you can access now on the internet to just keep track of things in that way. And it, And as you say, it is a little bit of a balance between um, spending time documenting things um, and because sometimes the thing can be done and accomplished in the time it takes to actually document that you <laughs> yes. need to do it. So, yeah, you know, I have, have a little rule if it's less than two minutes, I'm just going to do it without giving it further thought. And if it's, if it's more than that, well, then it can go on my to-do list and or into a project management system. Good enough. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Boy, it is to me so clear. Be yourself. <laughs> Only you can be you. It is tempting always to, at least for me and most of the people I know, to try on that cloak of somebody else. <laughs> and boy, that seems to be working for them. Maybe I should be more like them. Hmm, it's, it's tempting, but it's usually not a good idea. Hmm. You can be your best self. You can learn from the qualities of other people. You can learn from their experience, but you really do need to apply it to yourself. And then when you are your genuine self, you never have to remember, wait a minute, how did I act before? What did I promise I would do? Just be yourself, be your authentic self and continue throughout your career to be your best self and get better. Change is part of the deal. You will get better hmm. at whatever you choose to work at but I think it's often going to require a deliberate choice. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's great advice. And I like that you pointed out, you know, we can model off other people and learn from other people, but apply it to the way you do things or, or, or apply it to improving things, but still being you. Hmm. Very, Love very it. important. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Jane. This has been really great. Now, where can people find out more about you and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Well, sure. It's been a pleasure for me. Lots of fun to think about these things and talk about these things. So as you mentioned, my company is Dovetail Resolutions, and you can find us on the web. It is easy to find me on LinkedIn because there aren't that many Jane Bedells out there, if you spell my name correctly. So it's Jane and it's B-E-D-D-A-L-L. -L. And then my podcast is Crafting Solutions to Pod... 
I think I should be able to say the name of my own podcast. (laughs) (laughs) The name of my my podcast is Crafting Solutions to Conflict. And it's available wherever you listen to podcasts. And I have a combination of guests one week and then two weeks in a row. I have a very short host on mic where I talk about a specific topic or some tips or something in the news that's uh, just trying to be a little concise and pithy. Mm. Great. Well, we'll have links in the show notes to all those places and people can check it out and listen to the podcast as well. All right. Well, what's the number one piece of advice you'd like to leave our listener today as a kind of parting gift? (laughs) My parting gift is, because this is my perspective, don't be afraid of conflict. Don't be ashamed of it. You're not a bad person because you experience it. You are a human person. And so are the people you're experiencing it with. You can get better at dealing with it. You can become more effective, not overnight, not night and day, but you truly can get better at it. And the first step is to become more comfortable with the idea of conflict. Hmm. Great, great advice. And if you go and check out Jane's website, she's got some videos there and certainly listen to the podcast and that will give you some ideas as to how you can be better at dealing with conflict. All right. That's the plan. Finally then, Jane, who would you like me to chat with on a future Innova Buzz podcast and why? Oh my goodness. There are some interesting ideas out there and I am, I'm mulling a couple over. I don't have a perfect answer right now, but I think what I enjoy about your guests is the range, Hmm. the variety of perspectives that people are providing. And I think that's, that's the key because it gives us all something to mull over. Think about apply to our lives. So I'm still working on that one. Okay. All right. Well, we'll reach out to you and uh, get some suggestions then. Well, thanks again, Jane, for sharing your time and your insights with us so generously today and putting up with my little glitch at the beginning. And and <laughs> I, I've really enjoyed our conversation and learned a lot about how to better kind of accept conflict that, at, as an inevitable part of life and also how to deal with it and how to Take responsibility for our own communication, I guess, is is one of the messages that stood out for me, which is something that I'm always working on myself with. So thanks again for sharing that. I wish you all the best for the future and let's keep in touch. Thank you. I'd like that. I hope you enjoyed that informative and engaging conversation with Jane and took something away from her episode. It's clear from our conversation that conflict resolution can result in a good outcome for all parties if it's handled creatively and with an abundance mindset. Also, innovation and creativity requires some level of constructive conflict. I'd love to know what you took away from Jane's episode. Leave a comment below the blog post which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Jane Bedell. That is J-A-N-E-B-E-D-D-A-L-L. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Jane Bedell. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Jane there, as well as links to the Dovetail Resolutions website, and the other resources we spoke about in the conversation. Jane suggested we have a conversation with Louise Duncan, the Executive Director of Tetramap, and with Mark Helpert, LinkedIn branding expert from Connect to Collaborate, on future InnovaBuzz podcast episodes. So Louise and Mark, keep an eye on your inboxes for an invitation from us to the InnovaBuzz podcast courtesy of Jane Bedell. Remember to check out our Marketing Master Mini Class at innovabiz.co forward slash marketing master. It's completely free and accessible without even giving away your email. But most importantly, in less than 30 minutes, you'll gain absolute clarity about your ideal client 
and how you can communicate with them to build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship. And if you'd like our help to go even deeper into Marketing Mastery or our help with producing your very own podcast, then send me an email to jurgen at innovabiz.co and we'll set up a quick call just to have a conversation and find out if, indeed, we're actually a good fit for one another. Tune in again next week to the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got more fantastic guests lined up, including EOS Worldwide Visionary Mike Payton and Vivian Go of Simple Wealth Coaching. Stay connected with us by subscribing to the Innova Buzz podcast at innovabuzz.com forward slash subscribe. I N N O V A B U Z Z dot com forward slash subscribe. Make sure you never miss another episode. It would also mean a lot to me if you leave us a review because what you think matters. I'd love to hear your thoughts, your ideas, your suggestions or questions you have. So go ahead and share them in the comments below the blog post for this episode. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember, be awesome and keep innovating.